This podcast contains sensitive topics and discussions. Listener discretion is advised. A woman's three-year-old child is viciously beaten to death. Is she also a victim of this crime or is she a perpetrator? This is the Crystal Straw Story. Happy New Year, Amy, and Happy New Year to our wonderful audience. Megan, it's so wonderful to see you on video, and I brushed my hair for you, (laughs) and I'm excited about this new platform we're trying out. I know. It's hard to believe that this is actually our fifth season, or we're beginning our fifth season of Women in Crime, and with this new season, we are venturing onto YouTube for some of our episodes. So we are very excited to have our listeners, old and new, but I think we're also pretty excited to have viewers now. Right, Amy? Yes, and I'm excited for you to always see my mugs. They're always for you. What does that say there? They say you're the best. Yeah, so every time I take a sip, you will see that and be reminded. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's so sweet, Amy. (laughs) That's actually really, really nice. All right, so I guess you're saying my women in crime mug isn't going to cut it. I'm going to have to get something nice to you, too. Oh, yeah, you're going to have to get some affirmation for me, but okay. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Well, let's um, let's turn to our episode to start off our new season. Um, it is one that has been on my radar because it's local to us and it's been in our local news a lot. But I'd be surprised if many people beyond the tri-state area or even really the Jersey area have heard of it. Nevertheless, this is an awful case of the murder of an innocent child And the question of what his mother's involvement was. If I'm correct, Amy, you actually brought one of your classes to witness the opening arguments of this case. Is that right? I would love to say my whole class showed up, but unfortunately, only about, I think, eight students came. But yeah, it was it was so interesting. We went to the courthouse and we sat in the opening statements. I wanted to go to other parts to hear testimony as well. Actually, I'm sorry, we did hear one um, witness for the prosecution as well. Um, But unfortunately, you know, curriculum calls and I had to get back (laughs) to to our normally scheduled lecture. So we only got to go, you know, one day. But yeah, it's it was really interesting. And right down the street from college, right down the street from where we teach. Yeah, it's so local to us, which was actually helpful for the episode because I was able to get a lot of case documents, especially, uh, you know, local access always makes it easier. And we also know some people connected to this episode. So in today's case, we're, we were able to speak with prosecuting attorney Tara Wang, who's a senior assistant prosecuting attorney at the Morristown County Prosecutor's Office and who works in the major crimes unit. It was great speaking with her. We don't often get to speak with prosecutors, although we'd like to more often. Tara was able to fill in some critical details for us, as well as taking us inside the court case and its conclusion. So I look forward to integrating her into this episode, and we're very grateful Mm -hmm. that she was able to speak with us. In this episode, I will say also there are questions of responsibility, the potential causes of such an awful crime. And in this case, they use something called an open plea. So we'll discuss what an open plea is and what that means for a defendant. I also want to put in a trigger warning before we begin for our listeners here that this episode will revolve around a child's murder and the details are brutal. So please use listener discretion if you want to continue. For now, though, let's turn to the woman at the center of our case, Crystal Straw. Crystal Straw was born and raised in New Jersey, but early on, her mother and father separated, and Crystal's home was not a stable one. Crystal and her sister were temporarily placed in the custody of their aunt, but Crystal didn't seem to benefit from a stable home, reportedly experiencing ongoing behavioral issues. And about a year later, Crystal and her sister were given the choice. They could either stay with their aunt or they could move back in with their mother. Now, interestingly, her sister chose to stay with their aunt, who supported her and helped her graduate high school and eventually join the military. 
So this gave Crystal's sister a very pro-social way out of the home and a way to carve a very positive path forward. Unfortunately, Crystal did not seem to walk the same road. Um, she chose to return to her mother's home, which continued to be somewhat unstable. Doesn't that remind you a bit of those adoption studies where we talk about nature versus nurture? It and does, twins who are adopted. And, yeah. Yes, and, and raised in two different homes. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, it does. And, and though Crystal never got into serious trouble with the law, she also didn't really maintain employment or, or find real employment. She didn't further her education. And she chose several relationships that were not necessarily very good for her. So she wasn't, you know, walking that positive path that her sister was. Now, around 2014, Crystal met a man named Edwin Urbina, who had become central to her life. But the two would have a very tumultuous relationship. Now, Edwin was also local to New Jersey. Amy, where the pair met, like exactly, is unknown, but they became quickly serious. And even though they were around 20 years old at the time, they moved into an apartment together in Morristown. Obviously, we know Morristown. He was employed. He was able to support them because you said you weren't sure about her employment, right? They both had spotty employment at best, let's say. Okay. Morristown's sounds an expensive area, isn't it? I mean, we work there. In general, it is an expensive area. I have no idea about the full extent of Morristown, though, and I don't know what kind of... I know there are apartment complexes, so it's possible mm -hmm. that there's, you know, low-income housing as well. And honestly, we don't know what kind of apartment they moved into. Or, you know, did they move in thinking, yeah, we can afford this, and then realize they couldn't? Yeah. At the time they moved in together, they did not have any children, but it wasn't long either after they moved in that trouble would kind of come to the surface. See, only after a few months, after living together just a few months, Edwin was arrested in a drug deal turned robbery that went bad and he was sent to prison in January 2015. Was this his first brush with the law? I don't think so. And it wouldn't be his last okay, but either. But his first... Okay, but it's the first on record that we're aware of. That I'm aware of, yes. Okay. Um, and also remember, he was young. He might have had a juvenile record that was sealed that I wouldn't know gotcha. about. Mm -hmm. Within a few weeks of Edwin's departure, Crystal had apparently met another man with whom she had a very brief relationship, but this was unbeknownst to Edwin. Despite this clandestine relationship, though, Crystal maintained regular contact with Edwin, and he believed that she was being loyal and waiting for him to get out of jail. And Edwin was partially correct, Amy, because Crystal welcomed him back when he got parole. Again, the, the two had stayed in touch, and when Edwin got out, Crystal had a surprise for him. She had gotten pregnant right when he left, and the pair now had a baby girl together. And Edwin believes it's his. Is it, is it definitely Correct. his or is yes. it possibly the gentleman? Okay, because you said she was having relations with another man at the time, right? That is correct. But uh, to Edwin's knowledge, it was his child. But this okay. blissful new union would not last very long because Edwin violated his parole pretty quickly. And unfortunately for him, the judge was not pleased. Um, this is something I talk about in my classes. And, you know, I used to be a probation officer, probation slash parole officer. There's some violations that aren't that serious. Uh, you know, if you miss a curfew, even if you possibly return a urine and you don't test clean one week, let's say, for a certain substance, these issues can often be handled by a probation or parole officer. However, this must be much more serious if this is going to the court and if a judge is actually revoking parole and if you're being sent back to prison. So even though I don't know the exact mm -hmm. offense here, I have to believe this was a new criminal offense. And if I had to guess, mm -hmm. it was probably drug related, given what I know about Edwin's history. Mm -hmm. So Edwin was sent back to prison to serve the remaining three years on his original sentence. And that's why I say it must have been pretty serious. Mm -hmm. With Edwin back in jail, Crystal moved into a New York homeless shelter because she could not afford her living situation. And New York apparently provides better assistance to homeless citizens than where she lived in New Jersey. Now, Crystal did get somewhat of a financial break here, you might say. Not a great break, 
or the way she got it because her mother passed away from cancer. Um, But after her mother's passing, she left Crystal a small inheritance and a vehicle. So Crystal now had some means. And then unexpectedly, Crystal found out that Edwin was going to be paroled again a full eight months earlier than expected, early in December 2020, due to COVID credits. Have you heard of COVID credits? Exactly. Well, from what I understand, a lot of individuals were released early just because of the public health threat of the virus. So people that were on parole. And also there's an issue with overcrowding. Yeah. Right. So people were being released early, but I never heard the actual term COVID credit. So neither did I. And I, I knew exactly what you were saying, but apparently there are COVID cre- or there were COVID credits in New Jersey. So Edwin's released. Crystal is ecstatic. And she uses the money from her inheritance to rent a hotel room or a motel room at the Oyo Motel on Route 10 in East Hanover. And the couple resumes their relationship. Sorry, quick question. Going back to I'm stuck on the COVID thing. I believe I could be mistaken, but wasn't there something in New Jersey where they were offering incentives to people to get vaccinated? And if they got vaccinated, then they would get time off of their sentence. I don't recall such an issue. I'm wondering. But if, I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm, I just don't recall that. Yeah, so I'm wondering if that's COVID credit. Sorry, I'm a little stuck on that because that's very interesting. I'm so sorry. Okay, back to the hotel in Hanover. Crystal rents this room, but Edwin was in for a big shock, Amy, because when Crystal picked him up from prison and returned with him to their room at the hotel, Edwin discovered that Crystal had had another child while he was in prison. And this time, the child was definitely not his. How old is the other child at this point? A toddler? The, um, his child, the little girl, mm-hmm. she was mm-hmm. about five years old at this time, four to five years okay. old. And this was a newborn, this other child? No, he was, he was not a newborn. He was two and a half years old because he'd been born. Remember... Edwin had been gone for two and a half, uh, two to two and a half years. So he'd been. And born- Crystal never mentioned. Crystal never mentioned this child to Edwin. No, she did not. Did she think he just wouldn't notice? <laughs> I'm not sure what she thought. I'm not sure if she knew that their relationship would continue. I'm not sure if she thought maybe the father mm-hmm. of this child she would have a relationship with. It's unclear what her expectations were. But she definitely did not tell Edwin. He didn't find out seriously until they showed up at the hotel room. And I have to tell you, a shocked and infuriated Edwin packed his stuff and immediately left after discovering that there was a two and a half year old boy that was not his. So Edwin leaves and goes to stay with a friend and this friend's mother in an apartment. But just after two weeks, <laughs> Edwin had not gotten a job or, you know, he was not contributing at all financially to the household. And that was a condition of him staying there. His friend and his mother, they were paying and they said, look, you're going to have to contribute to the apartment, to expenses, to groceries. And he wasn't willing to do any of that. So Just two weeks after leaving, Edwin felt like he had no place to go but back to Crystal and her two children. And I'm assuming she opens the door for him. Absolutely. But Crystal had to figure out how they were going to live. By this point, her inheritance from her mother was long spent on the week-by-week rent to stay in the hotel. She had a vehicle, but Edwin wasn't working. And Crystal had taken out some small loans. She received some government assistance, but the benefits were not enough to cover four people now. Also, Edwin had a marijuana habit and his gaming hobby uh, that was eating a lot of their funds. So Crystal went out and took an overnight shift at a local quick check about a mile away from the hotel where they were staying. And she had worked there for just a few months until August of 2021. Let's hear Tara Good Wang. Good for her. The, sorry? Good for her that she's getting, you know, it sounds like she should be making him get, you know, while she takes care of the kids, maybe he's the one who should be getting a job. But it, it sounds like she's really trying to make things work here. I mean, I wouldn't let someone sit around the apartment smoking marijuana and spending money on a gaming habit. But yeah, somebody has to work in this situation, I mm-hmm. would say, when there's two small yeah. children. But as she's at work, Edwin and the children are staying at this hotel. 
So let's hear Tara Wang, prosecuting attorney on this case, describe the living conditions at the hotel. Rubina and Liam all resided in room 521 of the Oil Hotel in East Hanover. The Oil Hotel records themselves reveal that Ms. Straw had rented a room at the Oil Hotel since December of 2020. And since mid-June, they had resided specifically in room 521. In terms of the room itself, it was a traditional single room hotel room in most respects. Uh, I walk through the door, there's a bathroom on the left that has a tub shower, a sink, a toilet. On the left is a closet. And then walking into the room, there were two queen beds, a TV, a dresser, and a window. In terms of how they lived in the room, uh, there were bins, I'd say, plastic bins lining the walls in the bathroom and, and in the bedroom and in the closet that were filled with clothing and personal items. Uh, they were filled not with any food that you could like pick up and eat, but with kind of condiments or, you know, like a hamburger helper package, um, that kind of stuff that could become food or become part of food. Uh, there were hot plates, cooking paraphernalia, and fans were kind of covering the counter space. There was an air conditioning unit in the room, but it was broken. It was non-functional. So, I mean, collectively, I would describe the room fairly as cluttered, soiled, and on the day of the murder, the room was described by several witnesses as very hot. I will note what stood out to me personally from the photographs is that there were no children's books or games, and the only toy that was captured in any of the photographs was a single plush stuffed animal on the floor. So what we heard Tara end with there was that the photograph revealed one single stuffed animal on the floor. And she said that's really the only evidence of you know, children or anything to entertain the children that she could see in the room. This room was also, it's August we're talking about, and this room had no air conditioning, so it was extremely hot. She describes it as soiled. I wonder why, maybe I'll get to this later, maybe I'm jumping ahead a bit, but why is nobody, why does nobody have eyes on these children? Like they should not be living in this type of situation. Right. I am going to get to that later. So hold that thought. But that was okay. exactly one of the questions I have. I think I can answer that later. Um, mm -hmm. So let's now move to the evening of August 12th, 2021. Crystal brought home food from the quick check for Edwin and the kids before returning to the store for her 10 p.m. shift. That's often what she did, as I understand her routine would be to go get them dinner, bring it and then go back. As she did for every shift. Crystal left her two children, ages five and three, or two and a half to three. Um, I, actually, I believe the little boy named Liam was three at this time because it had been a couple of months since Edwin had come home. So she left them at the hotel while she went to work. So essentially, Edwin Urbina is in charge of their child care. Now, Edwin and Crystal were also known to have a hot, cold kind of relationship. And this evening wasn't very different. Crystal and Edwin had been arguing before her shift, and she called and texted him several times while she was at work to make up. But he didn't answer, which was a little unusual. Then around 2.15 a.m., Crystal had gone out to her car to take a work break to call a friend. And while there, Edwin finally called her, but it was not to make up. It was to tell her that her three-year-old son, Liam, had stopped breathing. Now, Crystal was already in her car, so one would assume that she just immediately called 911 and head for the hotel, right? She's outside in her mm -hmm. car, and she's a mile away. Yeah. But she doesn't, Amy. Her quick check coworker saw her run back into the building, clock out of her job, then run back to her car. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm going to judge this as harshly at the moment. Maybe she's in a little bit of shock. Yeah. Right. And she wants to she's afraid to lose her job because the family relies on her financially. So maybe she wants to make sure that she's at least doing what she needs to do, you know, to not get in trouble at work. Did she seem frantic? Did the co-worker say? 
Yeah, she ran. And surveillance mm-hmm. cameras showed her. It was, you know, she kind of, mm-hmm. she quickly went, uh, ran or, or walked okay. fastly. You know, she wasn't just hanging out for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and she got back to the hotel pretty quickly. Based on her phone records, her later phone records, uh, we know that Crystal Googled how to give CPR to a child, though it's unclear if she ever attempted CPR to revive her son, who was not breathing when she got back to the room. What is clear, Amy, though, is that neither Crystal nor Edwin ever called 911 for the child. What did they do? Instead, the couple left the lifeless boy on the hotel bed while his older sister looked on, a five-year-old, and Crystal and Edwin frantically cleaned the room and packed their belongings into the car before driving to Edwin's brother's apartment in Morristown. With the, with the deceased child? That's correct. He was in the car seat. Now, Crystal was dropping Edwin off, so she dropped him and his clothing off at his brother's, and then she proceeded with her daughter to go to the Morristown Medical Center and brought her son into the ER saying that she had been home all night with her children and that she woke up early in the morning to her son throwing up. This is the story that she's telling when she enters the ER. She claimed that her son Liam became unconscious after a fall while she was attempting to do CPR and before she'd rushed him to the hospital. She said that she'd fallen on top of him and that he'd stopped breathing. So that explains his injuries. Wow. And a five-year-old can talk, right? So is, did the daughter say anything? She was just kind of that thought. Great question. idly there? She, was, she okay. was there. Remember, they're rushing into the hospital. This is an emergency situation. She's by her mother's side, but not necessarily saying anything. But the issue was, Amy, that the hospital personnel didn't believe Crystal's story. I mean, she they quickly observed that Liam had many injuries to his body, bruising all over his face, arms, and buttocks that ha- could not have call- come from a fall or CPR. That was very obvious. The hospital uh, you know, personnel, too, they could clearly see that the boy was dead as she brought him in. You know, he was cold to the touch and had other signs of not, you know, just becoming unconscious. Although I will say they tried to revive him for over 45 minutes. This was a clearly suspicious situation, though, especially as hospital staff overheard Crystal tell her daughter not to tell anyone what happened that night. So you asked about her. As the doctors worked to revive the little boy, the police were called in right away to begin an investigation. Um, Right from the start, this was suspicious. The first to arrive on the scene was Officer Johnson, who'd been on the police force for about six years. And he did his best to make Crystal feel comfortable while keeping her company in the initial stages of the investigation. Right now, the police are brought in, but Crystal's not charged with anything. And really, the police don't know exactly what's going on because the doctors are still working on the little boy. I'm assuming they're not really tipping her off to any idea that maybe they're looking at her. They want to keep her calm and comfortable, right? They want her to cooperate. They also want her to, you know, she's told the story to the personnel, the hospital personnel, but they they want to hear it from her mouth too, what she's saying, Mm -hmm. what actually happened. At this point, just so you know, the police did separate Crystal from her daughter uh, in order, you know, for a couple of reasons. They wanted to, first of all, get Crystal alone, probably get the daughter alone. Um, But also, Crystal was quite hysterical back and forth, and I think they, they wanted to spare the daughter some further trauma. Crystal was upset but told the same story to Officer Johnson about her son being sick, her trying to help him. They fell um, while she was trying to give CPR. That's why he was unconscious. She was all over the place, really, I have to say. Uh, You know, but Officer Johnson continued to ask questions just to figure out the evening. Like, you know, what did he have to eat? What time did Liam go to bed? When did he start vomiting? So they're trying to substantiate her story at this point. And she didn't tell them that she was at work. Did she not think they would find that out pretty quickly? No, she said she was home for the evening. Yes. And, and what, what year is this? 2021? Yes, 2021 with surveillance and a co-worker there. That, that's, okay. Okay, so that's she did continue to talk for a little bit, but then she saw at one point 
outside of the door, she saw her daughter walk by um, with one of the security guards. And at that point, Crystal said she wanted to leave. But it was kind of too late because by now, Liam had been pronounced dead and Crystal was taken in at this point to police headquarters for questioning. And this would be official questioning. Now, because this was official, Amy, she was Mirandized and she was Mm -hmm. asked to explain again what had happened to her son. And this time would be on the record. Crystal did not request a lawyer, just in case you were going to ask that question. Mm -hmm. After her Miranda rights were read, she continued to tell the same exact story. But it was very, very clear, not just to hospital personnel, but to the police officers that this was not the truth. And so Crystal, at this point, was placed under arrest for child endangerment. I'm also wondering, did they were they interviewing the daughter at this point? Yes, they did. And I'll let you know what she said in a little bit. Okay. I should also let you know they were aware by now that there was a second suspect in this case based on the security footage of the hotel. Because not only did the quick check have footage, but the hotel did. And it showed Crystal and an unidentified male exiting the room at 4 a.m. Crystal refused to give any information about this man, who we know is probably Edwin Urbina, at her interrogation. Mm -hmm stating that she was a single mom and she took care of her own children and she didn't even know who the detectives were referring to. However, Amy, even though Crystal was claiming that she didn't really know who they were referring to, the surveillance footage got a pretty good shot of the man's face and what he was wearing. So using those images, detectives quickly got a flyer out to other law enforcement agencies and it took almost no time at all to identify a then 27-year-old Edwin Urbina. He's he's very well known to the police. They probably recognized him right away, right? <laughs> they did know him. I mean, he was a local um, mm-hmm. and it was not mm-hmm. hard to identify him. But where was he? Well, shortly after Crystal dropped him at his brother's apartment, get this, Amy, Edwin and some other friends and family took a trip to the Jersey Shore, a vacation. So Edwin is not concerned or does not appear to be concerned about the well-being of Crystal or her children. Um, And there were photos of him and his friends on the beach that were posted to social media. But what was great about that, Amy, is that an anonymous tipster Mm -hmm. called the police to alert them about this photo. Yeah, sometimes they, you know, people that are being looked at, you know, if law enforcement is looking for you, don't go posting things on social media. Not so bright. Not a good idea. Mm -mm, No. Through this tip, police got a lead on the people Edwin was hanging out with as well. And to rattle the tree a bit, the detectives distributed a new flyer with a mugshot photo of Urbina and the phrase wanted for murder of three year old under the photo. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. And this flyer was distributed throughout the neighborhood where Edwin's brother lived, as well as the surrounding Morristown area. And Amy, child murderers are not very popular where Edwin is from. And clearly feeling the pressure uh, from this move, Edwin actually turned himself in shortly after. I also, Megan, I don't like this move. I'm not going to lie. By police? I don't, you know, if if people are innocent until proven guilty, I I don't think this is really a fair move personally. Uh, why, Why not? Do you think this is labeling him? Are you worried about vigilante justice? Yes, a little bit of both. Again, if you're innocent until proven guilty, I don't think it's fair to the accused. At this point, he's just the accused. He's a potential suspect. Sure. And you can't, yes, vigilant. It's not fair for his family, the safety of his brother's family. And even if he is in fact guilty, our system shouldn't work like that, right? I don't know. I don't like it. Okay. I I see. I understand it as a tool of investigation, especially when a suspect appears to be fleeing and he did appear to be fleeing. He fled the scene. He's fled. He was trying to conceal his whereabouts electronically. Um, He wasn't coming forward. So I think that the police with the potential Mm -hmm. of having a child murderer out there, they had to apply some pressure. So I understand your point, but I also don't think Mm -hmm. uh, I I can allow for this in in these circumstances. Now, Edwin turned himself in, but he he came with a public defender and he did not speak to law enforcement. So there was no information that they were going to get for him. But as you had asked before, 
Crystal wasn't the only one who was interviewed. Her five-year-old daughter was also present that night, and the police definitely interviewed her and asked her what had happened that night in the hotel. This poor little girl described that her brother Liam had been beaten by Edwin Urbina, who she actually called her father. She said that Edwin had hit her brother several times in the face, on the arms and legs, and on his buttocks until her brother stopped moving. She also told officers that she had witnessed this type of abuse many times before, um, as Edwin Urbina had regularly beat her brother in this fashion. Um, was she abused as well? It appears that she, I, I believe she was abused somewhat, but it appears that her brother took the brunt of the abuse. Um, remember, Edwin believed that the little girl was his, and I think that's the reason why. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an extraordinary little girl, though. This is a traumatized five-year-old who likely just broke the case wide open. Now, further investigation into the potential crime revealed that Edwin and Crystal had purposely deleted text messages between one another when Crystal was at the hospital so that, you know, the police would not suspect that Edwin was involved. Again, you have to wonder if, you know, people not watch TV, <laughs> like, right. They, if you delete something from your phone or your computer, right. there's investigative tools that can see that. Yeah, these are not sophisticated criminal offenders. Um, mm -hmm. and, and clearly mm -hmm. their strategy did not work. Edwin Urbina was arrested and charged with murder, child endangerment, hindering prosecution, tampering with a witness, and tampering with evidence. So there's a lot of charges here. The evidence against Crystal was plenty as well, okay? There was a lot. So let's hear Tara Wang on this. In terms of Ms. Straw, there were uh, many pieces of surveillance video that were procured from which we were able to essentially track her movements prior to, during, and after the murder, from where she worked that night at Quick Check, from the Oyo Hotel itself, from uh, the Morristown Housing Authority, where they dropped Mr. Urbina off before ultimately bringing Liam's body to the hospital, where there also was surveillance footage. and. You know, from that, we were able to to track her to get a timeline of, of what she was doing um, and also observe her demeanor to an extent. Also, a very strong piece of evidence against kind of both of them together were uh, the text messages that were found on her phone. Um, so there was a Morristown police officer that sat with Miss Straw at the hospital, uh, his body worn footage was played during the course of the trial. So the jury was able to hear her story of what had transpired prior to her bringing Liam's body to the hospital. But then text messages were able to be retrieved from her cell phone that were also admitted into evidence. And those, you can see her sending some of those text messages on the body-worn camera footage. And she admitted to sending those text messages her between her and Mr. Urbina during her plea colloquy. She admitted to deleting them off of her phone, and, and those messages just tell a completely different story about what had transpired than what she was saying to the doctors and to the um, police. Okay. Even with the strong evidence that they had, though, and I, I think it was pretty strong, Crystal Straw and her attorney were engaged in plea negotiations. And I'm assuming they were going to ask her to testify against Edwin and give her a reduced sentence. If so, well, let's hear Tara on that. So in terms of the plea posture with Ms. Straw, uh, a, a plea was extended after an indictment was returned. That was for her to plead to two counts of second degree endangering the welfare of a child, one for Liam and one for as well as one count of third degree hindering for some of the conduct she did after the murder took place. And our aggregate recommended sentence was going to be 13 years in prison. However, that plea offer was always contingent on Mr. Urbina pleading guilty. And that contingency was never lifted. At a point in time, her attorney stated on the record that Ms. Straw was willing to accept the term of years. 
So what was also discussed ultimately on the record and in detail during Ms. Straw's sentencing was, you know, based in part on that representation. And when it became clear that Mr. Urbina may not be pleading guilty, we explored the possibility of replacing that plea contingency with a contingency that Ms. Straw provide truthful testimony at Mr. Urbina's trial. And uh, to the point of speaking with Ms. Straw with her attorney present about what that testimony would be. And in the state's opinion, that testimony that she was willing to provide was not truthful. It was not consistent with the other evidence that we had in this case. So ultimately, there was no meeting of the minds as to a plea agreement for her. So uh, she was either going to have to because Edwin Urbina decided not to plead guilty, she was going to have to provide, yes, evidence against him, right? She was going to have to testify against him. And I'm assuming his method here is going to be that Crystal did it and he didn't. Ah, you'll have to wait to is see that what at he's the doing? trial, but it's a pretty okay. good guess. Um, I think what's surprising at okay. this point, Amy, is that she's still protecting him and rejecting a plea Unbelievable. to protect him. Interestingly, though, Crystal did wind up with a, a plea of a different kind. So on January 12th, 2023, she did plead guilty to seven charges. Now, this means that uh, her seven, the seven charges were all the charges levied against her. So there was no reduction in the charges. Um, they included child endangerment, neglect, hindering prosecution, witness tampering. So she pled guilty to everything. And an open plea was utilized. Remember, I said I would discuss that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, this is similar to a blind plea, which means that a sentence has not been agreed upon. And both sides will argue for what they deem is an appropriate sentiment, uh, an appropriate sentence, ultimately leaving it to the discretion of the judge. And what is the benefit for a defendant here? Well, OK, she doesn't want to go to trial because at trial she's facing up to, I think it was 41 years. And so every defendant has the right to plead guilty to the charges against them mm -hmm. and then they can argue their case. So the prosecution, I think that the defense knows that with a plea like this, she's not going to do 41 years. She's not. She is okay. still pleading guilty. She's still saving the court the time of a trial. Um, there's going to be a benefit undoubtedly to her. And even though the prosecution didn't promise anything. I think the prosecution asked for something like 18 to 20 years. So we're still talking okay. about a significant reduction here. Mm -hmm. It's a gamble, though. Um, it's rare, just so you know, pleading guilty to all the charges and then leaving it up to the judge. But it was, again, a better outcome than she probably would have faced at trial. Was part of that deal that she would have to testify against Edwin? No, remember, she refused that. So she's not, there's no deal here. She's pleading guilty no. to the charges okay. against her, but it's not a deal she's receiving. You're just allowed to plead okay. guilty to the charges. She's pleading gotcha. guilty in full and okay. throwing herself on the mercy of the court, essentially. But mm -hmm. before we get to the number, because she is going to be sentenced by the judge, let's turn to Edwin. You know, would he change his mind now about a plea? Certainly not. Nope. Too arrogant. Yes, exactly. He definitely would not accept a, a plea record. Uh, I'm sorry. He would not accept a plea deal. And actually, let's hear what he had to say at this hearing. He did not accept that plea offer uh, at the pretrial conference, which is kind of the last major court event before the trial itself. He indicated on the record that he was rejecting that plea offer because he was not guilty, but that he would be willing to take a plea to a recommendation by the state of 10 years or less, which was not something that we would be willing to entertain. Did you just hear that? Who does he think he is? 10 years or less? He's saying, first of all, he, it's unbelievable that he's denying that this happened. Yes. It's, I guess he's saying like the little girl's lying. Yes. Yes. He's absolutely saying that. Like, it, it's definitely he's going to throw the blame at Crystal for sure and say that everyone's lying to protect Crystal. You know, he's not guilty, but he'd accept 10 years or less, which obviously was never going to be entertained by anyone. <laughs> no. mm -mm -mm. So Urbina goes to trial and 
Prosecuting attorney Tara Wang, who we've been hearing from throughout the episode, began her opening statements by telling the jury that this innocent three-year-old boy met a gruesome and barbaric ending after being abused by Edwin Urbina, who that evening in a hot and cluttered motel room was more concerned with playing video games without interruption from two small children, one of whom was not his own. It did seem to be that was his aggravation somehow, I guess from testimony elicited from the little girl that he wanted to play video games. In a seven-day trial, approximately 23 witnesses were called to testify, including the medical personnel, nurses at the hospital, who said they knew immediately that the 35-pound boy who was brought into the hospital had been deceased for some time when he arrived. Testimony from the medical examiner who conducted the autopsy detailed Liam's cause of death and his injuries. Tara Wang summarizes this kind of hard to hear testimony. He was beaten to death. I mean, there's just no softer way to put it that would be accurate. He was beaten to death by Mr. Urbina. Succinctly, his death was caused by him bleeding to death internally. There were a number of injuries that were inflicted. The medical examiner testified extensively at the trial about those injuries. He found traumatic injuries during the course of the autopsy to Liam's head, his neck, his shoulders, his abdomen, his back, his buttocks, his arms, and his legs. The medical examiner found those injuries were acute, meaning that they were inflicted immediately or very close in time to Liam's death. In terms of the main cause of death, the medical examiner found a full thickness tear to Liam's mesentery, which would have caused substantial and did cause substantial internal bleeding. Uh, he also found hemorrhaging to his kidney, intestines, and adrenal gland, as well as near his skull and brain and to the lining of his optic nerves. So in terms of how those injuries were inflicted, uh, the medical examiner testified that the injuries were consistent with the use of a number of weapons, including a hand or open palm. Some were more consistent with the use of an object, such as a slipper or a sandal. Some were more consistent with blunt force trauma, meaning a punch or a kick and some were more consistent with acceleration and rapid deceleration, also known as shaking. There were visible injuries on the exterior of his body, bruises and scrapes that were consistent with what was found internally during the autopsy to his face, scalp, chin, arms, shoulders across his back, his buttocks and his legs. So ultimately, Amy, the medical examiner concluded that the boy's death was clearly a homicide and that the immediate cause of death was uh, a fatal blow to the abdomen. I just can't believe that Edwin was taking this to trial. There is no world in which he is innocent here. What did he think was going to happen? It is shocking that he took this to trial. I, I would have to agree with you. When I listen to the medical examiner testimony, I'm always, we've heard cases like this before, but I'm shocked at the level of violence that it was not just one hit or one shake, that it's a punch a kick. Uh, it's hitting over and over again. And this is a 35 pound child. And this is at least, he was a big guy. He's a 240 pound man. At the trial, the Liam's older sister also testified about what she witnessed by Edwin's beating of her brother in front of her. And I think it was powerful. Witnessed the murder of her brother with her own eyes, and they were the eyes of a child. And to hear her recount what she heard and saw and experienced in her own words and in her own voice, to me was very powerful, as well as very important evidence. You could see how this would make a real impact in a courtroom. Oh, for sure. Um, I'm just wondering, she's with other family members, this child, or is she with the state? Yes, she is. Um, I'll, I'll actually talk about where she wound up later, but she was with another okay. family member during this time. Okay. So it's hard to imagine what the defense is going to come in with, but they attempted to show <laughs> that it was not Edwin, but rather Crystal who killed the boy. But their attempts were unsuccessful. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of evidence to show that 
Crystal wasn't in the room at the time. What was the cross? What was the cross examination of the child like? Do you know? Were they trying to discredit her? I doubt there was very much okay. cross um, at all. Okay. Um, you know, they might have summarized with the child might have been confused about the timeline. It's possible mm -hmm. that he saw uh, or she saw um, Edwin hit the child another time. It's even possible that she mm -hmm. saw the child get hit, but that wasn't the proximate cause of death. So I think yep. there's probably a mm -hmm. lot they could have done with it. Mm -hmm. I know that um, the little girl testified on closed circuit television, so she didn't have to go in front of the courtroom. Gotcha. Okay. I think that the it's not that hard to guess that the jury was most definitely persuaded by the state's case. And on March 1st, 2023, Edwin Urbina was found guilty of several charges, with the most serious being first degree murder with aggravating factors. So no surprise here. The outcome that I would have expected and one that everyone was glad about. Now, both Crystal mm -hmm. Straw and Edwin Urbina were sentenced by Judge Taylor, who presided over this case on March 16th, 2023. However, the sentences were very different. Edwin Urbina was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole, plus an additional Excellent. 20 years. So there is no chance that Edwin Urbina will ever get out again, which is the right conclusion. I think we would both agree. Mm -hmm. But what about Crystal? What kind of sentence do you think Crystal got? What do I think she got or what do I think she deserves? Um, I'm wondering if she was seen as a victim at all. Is there any evidence that she was also abused by Edwin? There was never a claim of it until the very end. Uh, but there was no evidence well, to support her claim. Well, I think she's probably grasping at straws because once she realizes that, you know, she's she's trying to get sympathy from the court of before course. her sentencing. So I'm not surprised that she would claim that she was abused only at that point. Right. Does she ever admit, does she ever um, throw Edwin under the bus even after he's found guilty by the court? She never throws him under the bus. No. No. I will tell you that she received a sentence of 18 years. If you uh, Originally, the prosecution had uh, offered her 13 years with her cooperation. Now let me And I'm also, assuming she has to sorry. serve Go ahead. She has to she has to serve 85% of that? That's correct. Yes. Okay. At least as we know. Let me tell you what Edwin Urbina said on the record at his sentencing. He said, <clears throat> "I Edwin Urbina remain innocent and I write this not to offend anyone but to be a reminder that slavery ended hundreds of years ago." He read from a yellow piece of legal paper and went on to say, not only was I charged with murder, but my co-defendant, Crystal Straw, a white woman, was not. He also stated that the prosecutor made him out to be a barbaric freak while Judge Taylor was one-sided from the beginning and had denied most of Urbina's emotions, would have, which he said would have allowed evidence to exonerate him. That was what he said at his sentencing to the judge. Wow. So he's not even not even at this point is he offering an apology or, or accepting any responsibility. Defiant to the end. Judge Taylor was clearly unmoved before imposing sentence. Crystal's yes. sentencing was a bit different, though. As you had asked, uh, she agreed to the open plea, uh, which I discussed above, but she was apparently too nervous to make her own statement. So her attorney made one on her behalf, saying that Crystal's actions were unfathomable in essence and reprehensible as a mother, but were the result of her fear of Edwin Urbina, who controlled all aspects of her life. Again, to point out, this was the first time any claim of abuse or fear of Urbina was raised. She also, you know, they were able to go through all their phone messages. And while it seemed that there was a hot, cold and tumultuous relationship, it did not seem that Urbina was he was abusing her or that she feared from uh, she feared Urbina. Anyone testify or any affidavits come in of other people saying that he was abusive to her? Absolutely not. There was not one shred of evidence to support this. Crystal Straw's attorney went on to say that her client was seeking help in prison through therapy and religious studies and trying to better herself. Family members of the boy made heartfelt victim impact statements as well, describing him as a loving child who would never get to have a future because of Edwin and Crystal's actions, and describing their devastation upon learning what had happened to him. Finally, Liam's sister, 
the five-year-old girl, was able to write a letter to the court. She said in her letter that she was happy now and living in a safe environment with a nice family, but that she missed her brother. She added directly to both her mother and Edwin, quote, I am glad you were in jail and that you can't hurt me again. That might be the one saving grace of this awful crime, Amy, that this little girl now has a real chance in life. So So let's turn to, I know it's an awful tragedy. And now we have to turn to the challenging part of the story, explaining why this happened to an innocent boy. This case reminds me a lot of another case that people had requested, and that was the Gabriel Fernandez murder. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. You saw the documentary, I'm assuming? Yes, I did see the documentary. And a couple people had requested it. And I thought about handling that case until I came across this one. And because it was local and I was just, I was more, you know, invested in in this case in terms of um, it being more, it seems more personal to me, uh, even if it wasn't quite personal. And doesn't get as much attention. I'm sorry? Yeah, not as much attention. There's not as much attention to this case. No, no. And I think just knowing some people involved and hearing firsthand, it had Mm -hmm. an impact on me. But it was similar in that you had a mother and an abusive boyfriend who abused, tortured, and murdered Gabriel. I think in Gabriel's case, his mother was more involved in the abuse. But similar to Asaro Aguirre, who was the boyfriend of Pearl Fernandez, Edwin Urbina was very angry by the presence of this three-year-old boy. He reminded Edwin of Crystal's other relationships, of her betrayal, and I would say likely his own failures. An antisocial career criminal with very little regard for humans other than himself, I think Edwin took his anger out on a defenseless, innocent child whose only crime was really being born. Edwin was a ticking time bomb, in my opinion, in this sense. And it might have been any number of small triggers that would have sent him down this path, whether it was a video game or not getting enough sleep or being annoyed by noise. I think this was an outcome that was going to happen. Um, I don't think that he feels any responsibility based on anything, likely blaming it on Crystal. But I don't think that he really blames the actual action on her. But the fact that she had a child that was not his and She Mm -hmm. left this child in his care when he did not want to be responsible for this child whatsoever. So any number of reasons, I would say, why he's not guilty and why he has no remorse. Yep. He's probably convinced himself that he had to do it because, you know, he was put in this situation he didn't want to be in. Yeah, I just think he denies any. I don't think he believes he knows that he did um, murder this child, but I don't think he feels any responsibility for it. Yeah. Crystal's a different story, though, isn't she? Um, And one of the reasons that I chose this case was I found her very interesting in terms of explaining how she could have allowed this and continued to be complicit with Urbina afterwards. What was her relationship like with the child's father? Did she have like hate towards him that she maybe took out on the child? I don't believe so. I don't believe there was any relationship, actually. It wasn't like a tumultuous no or a situation where okay not that I that not that I know of at all not also, that that it, would make it okay no 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 but it's like it's hard to explain without that um, some yeah. might ask was she abused herself mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's definitely a possibility given that she did not have the best upbringing some people asked about we have covered cases where women have been abused. And, and afraid of their victimizer. Mm-hmm. I do not believe that was the case here with Edwin. I don't believe there was any evidence to support that whatsoever. And I do think if that was if that was an explanation, it would have come out by her attorney as an argument way earlier than as an afterthought at sentencing. I know you mentioned Edwin's drug use, but what about Crystal? Does she, have a, does she have a history of drug use as well? There was some drug use, but I don't know the extent of it. And I don't believe that she was okay. as serious a drug user or regular as Edwin was. And certainly she wasn't dealing it, which I believe at some point he might have been as well. Mm -hmm. So putting the explanation aside that she was abused or a victim of Edwin's, well, it's hard to explain Crystal. I think that Crystal prioritized men above her own children, and in particular Edwin. For whatever the reason, Edwin became her central focus. I mean, look at it this way, Amy. She spent what little money she had to purchase him marijuana, a PlayStation for the motel or hotel where they were staying, with a broken air conditioner, but she got him a PlayStation and she provided food and drink for him every single day. 
But yet her children had no toys to play with. But she got Edwin a PlayStation. Exactly. So she seems to prioritize Edwin over her children at every turn. Mm -hmm. And this might be because of a misguided notion of love and loyalty. And, And really, we don't know her full childhood history, but certainly her father was not a stable fixture in her life. Her home life was rocky at best. And she had behavioral issues from a very young age. And I believe she had a seriously distorted view of healthy relationships for love. You know, she probably just didn't have the role models that she needed to see that would model what healthy love and health, healthy bonding looks like. So I don't think she was able to love her children in a healthy way. I think she did. I do believe that she resented her children. And in the end, I believe that she just couldn't bring herself to put her children before Edwin. She just believed he was the center of her universe and the most important. But what makes it very interesting or more interesting to me, Amy, is that along the way, she was not faithful to Edwin. She was not loyal to him. But perhaps also, is it possible that she felt her disloyalty was the reason for Edwin's actions? So she's responsible yeah, maybe regardless. She... What, what are yeah. your thoughts? Because she is an extremely complicated offender. And in the end, this is what I could come up with. It was her views or unhealthy views of love and relationships and maybe her own guilt over what had happened and her actions precipitating it possibly. Yeah, I'm wondering if she also saw the child as something getting in the way of her relationship. And maybe for her, you know, it sounds even awful to say, but maybe to her having a child not, like maybe Edwin did something that for her was going to strengthen her relationship with Edwin Mm -hmm. and was almost supportive of it in a way, which is just impossible to comprehend. I think this is one of those cases where there's nothing that can explain this because it's just, it, it's so horrific. I like, I just, I'm kind of at a loss with this one. Right. I think for sure there's got it. There must be something going on biologically or psychologically that would enable her to be a part of her own child's murder. Cause she, she played a huge part in this. I think it's very clear that of course she may be, isn't the actual reason as far as like she, her hands did not beat the child, yes. but her being so complicit is, is absolutely horrendous. It is hard to find. And, and it I was don't hard know. To yeah. And I don't know that that's even a long enough sentence for her. I'm assuming she's not allowed to have any contact with her daughter. No. Uh, that's part of like, no. the terms. That's okay. definitely that's part of good. the terms. And I really hope as her daughter said that she's in a healthy, happy home now. I, you know, I hope that is true for her and I hope that she can somehow you know, move past this, learn to trust again and, you know, be built back up after such a traumatizing situation she's been in. Yes. Just so you do know, uh, that was a great thought. And again, one of the things that we said, one of the positive outcomes is that Crystal's daughter is with a family member who is very stable, very loving. Um, She is doing very well, as I understand, very well adjusted, and she is very happy. So I think that is one of the positives to come out of this. It's such a sad story. It's almost like Liam's death, though, enabled this little girl to possibly have a life, which is certainly a tragedy. I'm so happy that she is in a home, a safe home right now. As for, you know, Crystal, I also hope that prison will be positive for her, that she will realize what she's done, the consequences of her actions. I hope that she can be rehabilitated. And as for Edwin Urbina, who will likely never accept responsibility, I hope that his days in prison are very long and very plentiful. Yes, I agree. (laughs) Okay, well, that is it for today's episode. We'd like to thank everyone for returning to season five of Women in Crime and welcome those who are new. And we look forward to another wonderful year with you all. Women in Crime is hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash womenincrime.
Sources for today's episode include NewJersey.com, the arrest warrants for Edwin Urbina and Crystal Straw, probable cause affidavits for both, grand jury indictments, an interview with prosecutor Tara Wang, the Morris County Focus, and morristowngreen.com.